today. Shakeout started back in 2008 uh, with a research study about what would happen if a big earthquake happened on the Southern San Andreas. And it was, uh, that study then became the basis of a government exercise. And a lot of us then of the Earthquake Country Alliance said, how do we get everybody else to participate to uh, uh, be able to practice earthquake safety? And so that scenario, which you can learn more about at shakeout.org slash scenario is what we're seeing here. And Dr. Lucy Jones, then at, with the USGS at the time, led like 300 scientists to work together on what would happen if this earthquake were to occur. And so with visualizations like we're seeing here, uh, done by the Southern California Earthquake Center, and many scientists and partners really created that scenario. And we created the first great Southern California shakeout drill. And it was based on social science research about what motivates people to get prepared. You know, they're hearing the same information from many organizations. They're seeing other people taking action and they're talking with others they know. Uh, and that really is what we tried to do with ShakeOut, make it something that would shift the culture about earthquakes and preparedness and kind of do things in new ways, increase earthquake resilience at all levels and encourage people worldwide to practice earthquake safety. We have people register so that all of that can happen. In fact, that's how we're, people are seeing that a lot of people are participating. And that's also how people can get information. So if you have not yet registered your shakeout drill that you're participating in, this counts. Uh, the drills we're gonna be doing here today, the education, you can register yourself at shakeout.org slash California and be counted as part of the world's largest earthquake drill. Now, uh, of course, we have a lot of people participating this year, but not as much as we did, of course, in 2019, the, really the record-breaking year. Of course, with COVID in 2020 and continuing still as it is, we have not yet rebounded. We really do look forward to 2022 as when we hope to be able to really get many more people back holding their earthquake drills and being involved. And again, go to shakeout.org. If you have not yet registered your drill, uh, whether it's you as an individual, as a family, as a workplace, school, et cetera. Interestingly, last year, uh, uh, while there was the pandemic, people did report that they still held drills. And, and of course we saw that just on the slide before. Uh, some uh, did that with though with different levels of social distancing. Many conducted the drill virtually, kind of like we're doing today. And we provided some resources for that. And this year, like, that, like then, while we're doing this today, it is International Shakeout Day. It's uh, the third Thursday of October you really can have your earthquake drills and count it for shakeout any day of the year. And that may be actually in different times. That, I might, that may actually be a good thing. Maybe you're doing your drill on a Thursday morning, but maybe next week you do another one that's at 5 p.m. Maybe if it's a workplace when people are leaving and you know not the normal time, because you learn more when you do it that way. And we also uh, encourage people to practice and do their drills remotely uh, through video conferencing. We have a lot of guidance on that at shakeup.org slash COVID-19 and including the drill leader presentations that make those online drills or even in-person drills really simple to do. And uh, we actually now I even have a Spanish version of that going forward. We're going to keep these as available as we probably are going to have virtual you know, uh, workplace environments into the future. It's kind of becoming a new norm to some extent. We also have uh, earthquake safety videos that you can see on our YouTube channel here, uh, but also you can download them at shakeout.org slash messaging. This is also great guidance to show your colleagues how to do earthquake drills, great to put into presentations, great to put out on email. So we want to remind people that when you do your shakeout drill, whether it's today or uh, with us all or on your own, uh, uh, do take pictures, but don't take a selfie as much because you really can't be holding on, covering your head, holding on to what you're uh, uh, underneath all uh, while holding a camera at the same time. So pass the camera around, take, um, take pictures of each other so you can practice correctly and then post those to 
social media or, or elsewhere and use hashtag shakeout. And then if you have some really great pictures, you can also email them to us at info at shakeout.org. Now, following today's uh, webinar here, there's actually another webinar that is similar to that shakeout scenario I mentioned that got uh, the, the uh, shakeout drills started. But this is for an earthquake in the Bay Area on the Hayward Fault. And there's a link here that will uh, hopefully get into the chat. Uh, where you can uh, join this explanation of what um, the final volume uh, describing the, the societal uh, implications and issues um, of the scenario for a 7.0 earthquake on the Hayward Fault in the Bay Area. So you're welcome to join that too. Right now, I'm going to uh, uh, bring on Dr. Bob DeGroote from the U.S. Geological Survey, who's going to talk a bit more about the earthquake early warning uh, aspects we talked about earlier. So, uh, Bob, I'm going to, if you turn your camera on, I will spotlight you. My camera is on, so, okay, there you awesome. go. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for, for joining today. In, in 2021, ShakeOut is even more important than it already is. The USGS operated ShakeAlert earthquake early warning system is up and running in California, Oregon, and Washington. And these are the three states with the highest earthquake risk. Over 50 million residents and visitors can benefit from ShakeAlert powered alerts that can come to their phone or impact them uh, at work or play in other environments. Businesses benefit from ShakeAlert because it can add resilience to their operations and most importantly, protect workers. ShakeAlert is one of the many earthquake resilience tools offered by the USGS. And you'll learn more about this from my USGS colleague, Lisa Wald, in a few minutes. Most importantly, ShakeAlert continues to improve due to the dedicated effort of many partners in California, Oregon, and Washington. In California, and I'll spotlight the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, the California Geological Survey, and our partners at the University of California, Berkeley, and the California Institute of Technology. Next slide, please. So what is ShakeAlert? ShakeAlert operates on ideas that we've known for many years. We know that information can be moved much faster than the shaking from an earthquake. So ShakeAlert does three things, detect, deliver, and protect. ShakeAlert is like an ultra fast camera. It takes snapshots of an earthquake as soon as it's detected at the surface. Those snapshots contain an estimate of how big the earthquake is at that moment and how hard areas around the earthquake will shake. The estimates, these estimates are, are being used by ShakeAlert partners to produce and deliver alerts that tell people to take a protective action like drop cover and hold on, or trigger automated actions on systems that slow down trains, that close valves to protect water supplies, or um, potentially open firehouse doors. The amazing thing about ShakeAlert is it's all completely automatic. We want to eliminate any delays at any step of the way. Next slide, please. So one of the takeaways from today is how can ShakeAlert be integrated into the seven steps to earthquake safety? ShakeAlert is a new tool for your earthquake risk reduction toolbox. And there are many ways it can be integrated in the seven steps. I'll give three examples. For step two, make, make having and knowing how to use ShakeAlert powered products like apps and services uh, as part of your plan. For step three, ShakeAlert should be part of your kit and sometimes uh, and check it out and make sure it's updated because um, more services are being added all the time. And in step five, knowing what to do if you feel shaking or when you get a shake alert powered alert. So one thing we ask you to do is consider doing a shake alert style shakeout drill next year, or even maybe even this year, if you're ready to do it. So if you haven't downloaded that app yet or gotten your phone set up, there's still time to do it before 1021. 
One way to keep up with what's happening with ShakeAlert is to follow us on Twitter. The, the account, the handle is at the bottom of the slide at USGS underscore ShakeAlert. Next slide, please. There are lots of ways to get ShakeAlert power alerts. And I know that, that my colleague at UC Berkeley, Jen Strauss, will be talking a little bit about my shake in a bit. But there are lots of ways to get alerts. And I mentioned earlier, and I've listed them here on this slide. Um, everybody in California, Oregon, and Washington have access to wireless emergency alerts, or WIA. It's the same system that delivers AMBER alerts, except they're being used for earthquake early warning purposes. Uh, also, our, our friends at Google deliver alerts through the Android operating system in all three states. Cell phone app availability varies from state to state, but there are three apps that you can take advantage in California. There's MyShake, there's also Quake Alert USA, and also the, the earthquake early warning functionality in the San Diego emergency app. For more information about what's available, that you can certainly contact your state emergency management agency and they can tell you what, what you need to do. Next slide, please. As I mentioned earlier, earlier, ShakeAlert is one tool in the earthquake information toolbox. ShakeAlert is first out of the gate. If you look on the slide after zero seconds, zero seconds being when the earthquake begins deep inside the earth, ShakeAlert is the first product that will detect that particular event and um, basically get the process moving. But there are many other very important earthquake information tools from the USGS. And it's my pleasure to pass this presentation on to my USGS colleague, Lisa Wald from the USGS in Golden, Colorado. Thank you. You're gonna share your screen, right, Lisa? Yep, I am going to share it, right? It says disabled still. Just one second. Mm Oh, I know what I need to do. Now you can. Okay. All right. Um, so hopefully everyone can see this now. Um, this is the homepage of the Earthquake Hazards Program website for USGS um, at earthquake.usgs.gov. Um, after you felt shaking, you probably want to know where the earthquake was and how big it was. And um, we have a lot of information uh, on our website. Uh, if you go right to the homepage and look here, you'll see a list of significant earthquakes in the past 30 days. And what you just felt is probably gonna be right here at the top. Um, it's that we don't have an earthquake right now. The last one that we've had uh, worldwide that we consider significant was in Greece. Um, so I'm gonna show you some examples from other earthquakes um, since we don't have one here in California to show you right now, thankfully. Um, if we click on that, um, on, the, on the event title right here, it'll bring us to what we call the event page. And uh, right at the top is the basic info, the magnitude and the location, the time, the latitude, longitude, and the depth. But there's a whole lot of uh, other really cool information on this event page. And the, the information that's on here is gonna vary depending on where the earthquake is and how, how large it is. Um, but one of the first things you can look at is this interactive map because this interactive map kind of puts together a bunch of information. Um, 
sorry, I need to move things over so I can see. Um, Hold on, I need to have access to things on the screen. Okay, um, so the interactive map puts together a whole bunch of data on one map and you can interact with it. Uh, you can zoom in and out, you can pan. Uh, we're looking at the 6.2 uh, on Hawaii from, um, I think it was last week. And um, so what we, the cool thing over here is in the top right corner, there's a bunch of layers you can turn on and off. Uh, by default, you're going to see the epicenter as the star and then the contours of the measured shaking from our instruments. But we have a new layer, uh, the population density that you can turn on. And you can see that coming up as the grade areas. And then what's really cool is you can put uh, the did you feel it responses on top of that too. So on this particular map, you can see that um, obviously, most of the did you feel it responses came from the populated areas. <laughs> um, so you can also turn on uh, tectonic plates and U.S. faults, which is, which is really cool, and historic seismicity, um, which you can see here. Um, let me close this and show you um, the same thing from another uh, from another event. Uh, so that we can see the plates. So here's the interactive map for the 8.2 uh, near Alaska, offshore Alaska. And we can turn on the tectonic plates, which you'll see coming up down here. U.S. faults, which you can see if I zoom out. And we can see the U.S. faults here in Alaska. Um, we can turn on population here. There's not much. <laughs> Um, but anyway, you can play with these layers and zoom in and out and pan around. And the key is, the little key icon is the key for whatever you're looking at. Whatever layers are on the map are going to show up on this key here. So that's uh, one of the first things that you can do um, when you get to, to the event page. And another thing that I want to make sure you know about is, uh, and you probably do, is did you feel it? Um, we have two tab tabs here. A did you feel it that shows you the information? Um, and this is just isolated. You can see it on the interactive map, but you can also see it here. And you can also look at these tabs. Um, you can look at a map by zip code. You can look at the intensity of the shaking versus distance on a graph and many other things um, on the did you feel it specific card. Um, and the other thing is the felt report TELUS. So this is where you go if you want to if you want to tell us your experience of the earthquake. It helps us make this. Did you feel it map here? Um, without your reports, we wouldn't have a map at all. So if you click on this, it'll bring up a report, and it's available in English and Spanish. And you can answer a few questions here, and then your citizen science data will end up on this. Did you feel it map here for everyone to see? Um, some of the other information that we can get here are the shake map, which is the felt, the shaking uh, not felt by people, but measured by the instruments. Um, and pager is uh, a measure of impact of the earthquake, both economic losses and estimated fatalities. And these are estimated losses, not real. These are estimated by a model, and this helps with response after the earthquake. Uh, for, some, or for some earthquakes, we're going to have ground failure estimations, like uh, where you might expect to see landslides or liquefaction. And we may have an aftershock forecast, which will tell you the probability of aftershocks in the coming weeks or months. Um, another thing that a lot of people don't know about is this view nearby seismicity, um, which will show you the earthquakes that have occurred in the three weeks previous to this earthquake. And if you're three weeks out after the main shock, the, earth, the earthquakes that have occurred three weeks after. Um, so now going back, I have to keep moving this around. So one more thing I wanna point out is Um, is that if we have a very uh, 
impactful earthquake. Um, and I need to go to this other one. I'm sorry, I have to keep moving this around. Parts of the Zoom are covering up my screen. Um, um, all right, well, if, um, if we have a very impactful earthquake, um, you're gonna see a tectonic summary down here at the bottom, which is handwritten by someone usually within the first hour after the earthquake. And it will give you the, the uh, tectonic context of the earthquake. Um, there's also an automatic summary on the regional information tab. And this is a longer like background information of the area. Um, so those are some of the things that you may not have known about um, on the event page. And um, just wanna end by saying, if your uh, earthquake is not on that homepage yet, uh, you can always go to the latest earthquakes uh, map. There's a link to it right up here at the top of our homepage. And you can see all the earthquakes that have happened um, in the worldwide um, by looking at this map. And then you can uh, change the parameters over here to. Uh, for what you're seeing and the settings that you're looking at on your map and your list. One last thing, and then I'm done, is we have an FAQ here on the homepage, frequently asked questions. And if you have a question, it's probably there. And the answer is probably there. That's the first thing to go check. Uh, if you have questions about what you're seeing on our website or on our latest earthquakes page or on the event pages. And uh, thank you for listening this morning. I will stop sharing. Thank you very much, Lisa. We did put the chat, uh, the, the webpage for all that you were sharing into the YouTube chat. So I'm going to set things back up again on sharing and trying a, I made a change in the Zoom settings. So I'm gonna see if it might work this time in a new way. Um, We'll take a moment to get it um, showing on Zoom. No, it's not not doing what I hoped it would be to actually show the the Zoom window uh, through Zoom. But okay, so next up we have a great presentation from our colleague at the Southern California Earthquake Center, Dr. Christine Goulet, about uh, the cutting edge research conducted. Uh, by so many scientists, as you'll hear about working together to help understand our earthquake hazards and risk in California. Hi, my name is Christine Goulet. I'm the executive director for Applied Science at the Southern California Earthquake Center, headquartered at USC. We're a research center and we study earthquakes, why and how they occur, and we evaluate their effects so we can help society better prepare and recover from them. To achieve this, SCEC functions as a collaborative center. Uh, we coordinate research from hundreds of researchers coming from dozens of institutions from everywhere in the US, but also from around the world. We collect data, we analyze it, we develop models, and uh, we use those models to forecast what we can expect in future events. Our natural laboratory is Southern California because that's where we, uh, we learn and that's where we apply new ideas. However, a lot of what we learn and the research products are applicable to all of California and beyond, but also to other places around the world. When people think of earthquakes, they often think of the shaking and the, the, the frightening effects uh, that they have and the sounds and all that. But before we can feel those earthquakes, there's a lot of stuff going on right underneath our feet. And uh, it starts from uh, deep inside the crust uh, somewhere. The stresses are just too much and the crust breaks. And then the rupture propagates along a fault. And in doing so, it emits waves uh, that travel to different kinds of geologies and so on. And eventually they reach the surface. And depending where we are, and uh, if we're on a deep sediment basin, on top of a mountain, on, on hard rock, 
the waves are going to get amplified or de amplified. So if you think about it, even in those simple terms, you can see there's a lot going on. And to really understand what's going on with earthquakes, we need specialists from all kinds of disciplines all working together. We need physicists, geologists, geophysicists, geodesists, uh, seismologists, engineers, and so on. And so when I say that SCEC is a collaborative center, it's because it's has all those people working together to try to solve complex problem, problems uh, regarding earthquakes. So SCEC is community-based. So it's now no surprise that uh, a lot of our models are called community models. They represent consensus uh, among uh, diverse scientists working together. And we have all kinds of models. Some uh, characterize the faults and where they're at and, uh, and and are they uh, vertical faults? Are they dipping? What do they look like? Do they bend? Do they connect with other faults and so on? We have models that tell us how fast the waves travel uh, through the earth, uh, depending on what the geologic units they, they, they go through. We have the geologic models themselves. We have uh, heat flow uh, that tells us what's happening with the heat in the crust and how, how uh, it can impact uh, earthquake physics and so on. And uh, we have uh, models that, that uh, show us uh, how the, the Earth deforms because it's a dynamic system that's always in constant motion. And so we can use uh, GPS uh, for that, for example. And in general, all these models are, are based on the data collected that can be straight in the ground or from sensors or from satellites even. And there are many other ways in which we integrate research results into bigger products. Uh, one of those is the, what we call earthquake rupture forecasts. Uh, for California, SCEC has developed with the US Geological Survey, USGS, the USURF3 model, that's the most recent version of the model. And that stands for Uniform California Earthquake Rupture Forecast. And this one has not only um, the description of where the faults are and, and how they're interconnected, but it also provides us with information on, on how often we expect them to produce uh, earthquakes of different magnitudes. And these are usually on the time scales of hundreds to thousands and thousands of years. And this is an important product because it goes straight into the national seismic hazard map. And that in turn uh, feeds into design in general and also into the national building code. Another way we integrate models uh, is by running uh, computer simulations. We're big users of uh, high performance computers or HPCs, what people sometimes refer to as supercomputers. Um, and we use them to run our simulations. We have access to the largest uh, research supercomputers in the US and we uh, routinely run simulations. Uh, it's been going on for decades at SCEC. And uh, the shakeout scenario uh, uh, came from a simulation uh, conducted in collaboration with the USGS in 2008. Since then, we've learned a lot. Uh, there's more refinements to the modeling and the simulations that we do, but the concepts are all the same. Uh, so we integrate new research results in, in our modeling, and we can model the fault rupture, uh, you can see the rupture front along the fault as it progresses, uh, and then the resulting ground motions at the surface. We can estimate the displacement from one side of the fault to the other, and these simulations are, are not only useful to, to generate pretty videos, but <laughs> there's a lot of physics in them, and they're really important. The integrative nature of the research conducted at SCEC uh, that pulls from all those different disciplines that integrates uh, research from micro studies to hundreds of kilometers of studies because we have to deal with multiple scales and uh, the, the human time scale and thousands of years in the temporal scale is really where we can contribute to resilience by providing better assessment of what can be expected in the future. Uh, this can inform the design not only of single structures like uh, buildings, but also of uh, infrastructure, um, all the lifelines we rely on. So water supply and distribution, uh, gas, electric power, telecommunication, and roads, 
uh, you know, uh, all these things need to remain intact for society to function, for us to continue to play our role in society. And that's one of the very important role of SCEC. Thank you. Christine, thank you very much for that fantastic overview of so much research happening that, you know, is really to help make a difference for all of us in California. And do we have any questions that have been put into the chat uh, of any of our presenters so far or for Christine? Um, and really, we do encourage you to put questions in the chat for our presenters as they're coming. Uh, so Sharon, is, have you seen any yet? Um, we had one question from Joe Beth K wondering about New Madrid activity. I see, uh, and thank you for joining us from, I see from Arkansas in that question. And um, we uh, uh, work together with our partners at the Central U.S. Earthquake Consortium and uh, our CUSEC, C-U-S-E-C dot org. And uh, while we're not really, while we're here focused on California, uh, fortunately, uh, New Madrid can have large earthquakes, but not as many and not as frequent as we have here in California. So, um, Christine, I, uh, did you have any comment about how the waves propagate in the uh, uh, eastern and central U.S. that is kind of different from California? Yes, uh, in general, what happens uh, in the region pretty much uh, everywhere east of the Rockies uh, in U.S. and Canada is that the waves don't attenuate as much. So if you have a, an event of the same magnitude with the same energy level released, the waves will travel uh, much farther. And that's, uh, that's, that changes how we model ground motion. Uh, recently, uh, I co-led the development of a, a, a ground motion model called the NGE East. Uh, that is now used in the building code and so on. So if you want to know more about that, I invite you to send an email. But there's a lot of active research uh, everywhere in the country, uh, although SCEC focuses more on the California issues because the fault system is completely different. The attenuation is different and so on. So there's value in, in, in focusing on that here to learn more. And it's also a lot of the principles that we've learned through SCEC and other activities uh, in California have been applied to the modeling we do on the East Coast as well. So uh, as I said, it was not just uh, lip service. <laughs> what we learn here can be applied and, and uh, the, the, all the work done was really useful in, uh, in NGE East. Uh, we use SCEC simulations to constrain some of the ground motion. So um, yeah, like you can, Send me an email if you have Thank you, Christine. Thank you very much. Okay, we will um, move on to uh, uh, our next presenter, and that is David Passy with Region 9. I'm going to, since you don't have slides, I'm actually going to stop um, um, sharing the screen, and that should hopefully allow you to be seen along with our, our uh, sign language interpreter once it... Um, so David, go ahead. All right, well, good morning. And uh, FEMA is eager to participate in this online great shakeout activity here in California. At FEMA, sometimes we mark our calendars and even schedule vacations around known disaster seasons. Hurricane season generally runs June through November and tornadoes typically hit in the spring and we get flooding here in California in November through the winter. Fire season seems to be expanding, but is generally late summer through the end of the year. But we all know that we cannot identify yet an earthquake season. We don't know when a large magnitude earthquake will turn our lives upside down. But at FEMA, we're interested in helping all people and communities prepare for this great risk that we face. So earthquakes arrive without notice, and we know that you can't just drive away when they hit like you might with other natural disasters. And so I wanna highlight four ways that we're striving to help people um, apply as they prepare now for major earthquakes in California. First is knowing and practicing drop, cover, and hold on, what we're gonna to do today in a little more than an hour. This is the great second great shakeout in a COVID environment, so it's a perfect day for those, those of us working at home to be mindful of sharing this drill with our family members, or if we are in an office 
then when we do return home to make sure that our families and neighbors know these simple measures they can take to prepare for disasters, it's critical that we make our personal safety a priority. And so remind the people around you that we wanna practice drop cover and hold on. Second, it's critical that each of us has a disaster plan. We need to know where we're gonna meet up with family and friends if we're separated when the earthquake strikes. Um, recognizing that roads and transportation systems may be damaged, we're gonna be potentially apart from each other for a period of time. And so as part of our plan, we build an emergency communication plan that includes an out of state contact, an easy number that everyone in the family can contact to make sure they can check in and let family members know where they are and that they're safe. As part of our plan, we recognize how we can use our mobile devices smartly. So that might mean texting versus calling because systems will be challenged. And that may be a way for us to extend our battery life. Part of our plan is getting to know our neighbors, recognizing that we may be the difference for them or they for us. And that's especially important for neighbors who may be older or may need extra care. As part of our plan, we make a supply kit that includes enough food and water for at least a few days. And we can all start by um, compiling essential supplies we already have and then adding resources as, as resources, excuse me, adding to that kit as we have the funds to do, to do that. It's helpful to have a small kit in our car, in our school classroom or in a locker, and then in an office so that we don't keep all of our supplies in one place and we're ready when the earthquakes strike. Next, I would say we wanna protect ourselves at home. We can conduct an earthquake hazards home hunt and recognize that bookcases, refrigerators, televisions, and objects that hang on walls can become dangerous when the earthquakes strike. We can move heavy or breakable objects from on top or high shelves down to lower where they're less likely to be damaged or cause problems for us. And then for those of us um, in our homes, we may look at what we can do to make that home safer. And so we'll hear later from uh, our partners at the California Earthquake Authority who continue to run the very successful earthquake brace and bolt program. Um, that we'll be receiving some additional funding as well. Next, we wanna prepare financially, and that can include earthquake insurance. Standards homeowners policy, excuse me, a standard homeowners policy doesn't include earthquake damage. Now, renters policies may. So again, we protect ourselves financially, and there are also some lower cost insurance policies called parametric insurance policies that can pay faster and help us out when earthquakes strike. As part of our preparation, it's important to have hard copies of financial documents like deeds, appliance serial numbers, prescriptions, and health records stored outside our home, or we can make digital copies of those and store them on the cloud so that if our home is damaged, we have access to information that really helps us get started in our recovery. FEMA has a tremendously helpful app on tips and, and alert information. So I encourage you to download the FEMA app. You can find that for both Google and iOS. And then I just emphasize these four Ps again. We wanna practice, drop cover and hold on, plan for your family, protect yourself at home, and then prepare yourself financially. These small steps to be earthquake ready will make a, a big difference when the big one strikes. And so we welcome opportunities to partner with research organizations, with government and non-government partners. And we're eager to make sure that all Californians know that they can take steps today to be ready for earthquakes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. And uh, I want to just mention that uh, as our uh, around the world, people are drilling today at 1021 local time. We did just pass the 1021 mountain time. So we're uh, participating shakeout uh, uh, states and the mountain time zone just had their drill as others have already around the country. And uh, want to um, uh move quickly here to a presentation uh, by Glenn Granholm. 
uh, on uh, how to secure your space. One of the real key issues about preparedness uh, and being safe uh, from what causes injuries during earthquakes. So um, Glenn, I see you're there and um, I'm going to uh, spotlight you for a moment, but then if you could uh, wave hi to everybody, uh, uh, let's see if you'll show up and then turn your camera off so that we're just seeing the sign language interpreter. Thank you very much. And you're on. Hello everyone, happy shakeout day. My name's Glenn, and today I'm going to be talking to you about step one of the seven steps to earthquake safety, secure your space. Why are we even talking about building contents? Well, recent studies have shown that the probability of an earthquake so big that it collapses a building is much lower than the probability of an earthquake that causes things inside that building to be tossed about. The 1994 Northridge earthquake showed that in dynamic fashion when almost two dozen hospitals closed primarily because of non-structural damage. So that's why we're talking about it. Any good writer knows to address who, what, where, when, why, and how when presenting an article to get information across. That would be the next slide, Mark. This presentation is like our own video article. And we have already addressed the why. So next slide. Let's talk about what we do. We conduct a hazard hunt. The photograph here shows a hazard carefully hidden in a bedroom. Do you know what it is? Locating hazards in your home is about as easy as identifying the fact that a bowling ball could fall on people's heads unless it's moved. Next slide. So let's find out exactly what is involved in a hazard hunt. It goes like this. If you're going to, you are going to look around your environment and ask yourself these yes or no questions. Could something injure someone if it fell on them in an earthquake? If so, secure it. Could an item block an exit or entrance if it tipped or fell in an earthquake? If so, secure it. What if an item is, is attached to a gas line where if it moved in an earthquake, a potential fire could start. You'll wanna secure that item. What if something could cause significant financial hardship if it was damaged in an earthquake? Secure it. How about things that could cause a big mess that you don't wanna clean up after an earthquake? Secure that. Next slide. What are some examples? Well, uh, not that, there you go. Uh, well, a large item that could hurt someone but if it fell on them would be like an entertainment center or a China hutch. How about items on an exit? The picture here in the center uh, top shows several potential doorway blockers. Some of them are wall mounted. Remember, size doesn't matter here, doorway blocking does. Dryers are often attached to a gas line. Be sure to secure those so we don't have a fire. At one point, I was asked to secure a Joe Montana autograph football helmet. It's a football helmet for crying out loud, but it was valuable and it got secured. And the last picture on the bottom right is from my home where about 500 items are stored in a little house that's hanging on the wall. Those can be secured. In fact, you can make your home or work environment very safe ahead of the next earthquake. How do we go about doing this? Well, not like this. This has been a best practice for years. Angle clips, small pieces of steel put on top of items. In earthquakes, they tend to twist, bend, and separate. Bad news in earthquake shake table tests. So we don't do this. In fact, experts now recommend that you use either an engineered bracket or flexible fastening using very high bond adhesive. That allows the wall and the floor to move in different directions, which is exactly what happens in earthquakes. So number one, we fasten furniture and equipment with properly engineered and installed brackets or flexible adhesive based fasteners. We secure collectibles or small items with earthquake putty or wax. 
we secure items that are hanging on the wall with closed loop connectors so they don't hop off the hook or nail in an earthquake. And then we ensure cabinet doors stay closed with proper connectors. They make them, you know, latches that close in an earthquake. In fact, all the items you need to make your space earthquake safe are available in most home stores or online simply by searching earthquake fasteners. We're almost done here. We talked about why the probability of an earthquake creating non-structural damage is much higher than one causing structural damage. We mentioned what? Conduct a hazard hunt, identify risk in your own environment. How? Properly secure non-structural building contents, step one of the seven steps to earthquake safety. So who's gonna do this? You are. If you need help, ask for it. When is this gonna happen? Today, it's shakeout day. That's the next slide. Where is this gonna happen? Look around. Your entire environment is ready to be fastened. Go out and secure your space now and get ready for the next earthquake. Thank you. Glenn, thank you very much for that presentation. And uh, Safety Proof is one of uh, the companies that we work with. We're hearing from our another partner uh, in, a, in a little bit later. We've been providing trainings on how to secure your space to people throughout the year. Uh, the Earthquake Country Alliance uh, has been that Glenn and, and a colleague from Ready America, Trevin, who we'll be hearing from a little bit, um, uh, working together uh, and often providing materials uh, to the participants uh, for free. So thank you very much for your partnership, Glenn. And Jason, uh, we have an activity plan here. If you want to just get some chat going on, uh, go ahead. That's right, we do. And again, thanks everybody for being here. We just heard a great presentation about how to secure your space. So right now, wherever you are, look around you and ask, what can you secure? What three items around you could you secure? Maybe some tall, heavy furniture, like a bookcase, maybe some small breakable objects and you can use some putty, such as Glenn was just talking about. Or maybe you can just move some heavy furniture away from a critical doorway that you don't want to get jammed or obstructed during or after an earthquake, right? Uh, tell us what you are going to secure right here below in the chat on YouTube. Tell us what around you that you might have already secured even. Um, I see someone already wrote a bookshelf. They're gonna to plan to secure that. Uh, most injuries from earthquakes are caused by these objects around us that aren't secured. And then we trip over them or they might actually hit us or even cut us or cause other types of problems and injuries. So it's very important to secure your space. Learn how to do it more at secureyourspace.org and tell us what you are planning to secure today or this weekend or in the future. And with that, we'll keep looking at your stuff in the chat, what you guys are writing in the chat. Uh, but uh, Mark, do you want to have us uh, move on here to some of the other aspects? Uh, yeah, just because we've everybody had people, about captions and things. Yeah, because we've had people join uh, more recent than the instructions earlier, we want to just let people know that uh, uh, you've joined with YouTube, you should be seeing English captioning. Uh, as on the, the slides here, uh, we do have um, uh, subtitulos en español, uh, and you see the, the link there, um, so that you can follow along separately. The recording of this event will be in, uh, on the same YouTube channel once we finish today. Uh, also, uh, we are... Uh, trying to make sure that our sign language interpreters are being seen as much as possible. Who has a, um, and that's not showing right now on the YouTube. That's what I'm trying to figure that out. So um, uh, if you aren't seeing that, uh, 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 we'll put, well, I guess we need to put the, uh, instruction again about how to join the actual uh, Zoom uh, webinar, uh, Jason, that would, that would be helpful for people. Okay, so uh, 
just a little bit of a technical thing. I'm, I'm uh, going to, I see we're, we're transitioning to Courtney. Is that right? Uh, let me just get this going again. And while Mark's on that, again, thank you everybody for commenting on how you're going to secure your space. Some great options here, grandfather clock, China hutch, even someone, uh, someone mentioned even a, a dryer, a laundry dryer. Um, all good things to think about and how you can make them more secure from earthquake shaking. Okay. Um, one of the things I just want to uh, share some new resources that you may uh, find useful. And uh, I'm wanting to make sure that we're seeing the interpreter. Um, Still, so just a moment to resolve that. Um, I'm going to remove that, may be what is. So, we only want Courtney um, on right now. It'll take, there is a delay on the YouTube. So, the Earthquake Country Alliance has people working across the state together to create resources and activities, at, uh, such as today's webinar and uh, webinars that you may have been hearing and watching throughout the year. And if you're not a member, you can go to earthquakecountry.org slash alliance to join. Uh, just another second here. Ah, that's what's, that's going to fix it. Okay. So uh, a key message, way, way we organize our messaging is the seven steps to earthquake safety that we'll put the links into the chat for these, but what to do before, during, and after. We are very excited to be rolling out some new uh, materials in multiple languages. So we have uh, a, a Spanish language website, terremotos.org. Uh, that's fairly, um, basically a version of the earthquakecountry.org website. We also have this shakeout website in Spanish, but we're now creating uh, uh, and, and adding to the website materials in 15 languages, the top languages spoken in California. And you now can go to earthquakecountry.org slash languages. We should put that link there too, uh, to see the first set of materials that are now available. So uh, you'll see the list of languages and the materials there that are shown on the screen right now. So our, our, our uh, earthquake safety uh, guidance on the left there, uh, what to do during an earthquake, as well as our seven steps to earthquake safety, information about shakeout, and, and just a, a variety of recommended actions to do in different situations. So you'll see those materials. We also do have an accessibility committee that's making sure that these materials that we're developing are fully available to people who uh, may use a screen reader who have low vision or blind to, so they can, uh, uh, their, their computer can read the materials out loud to them. So all of these materials are being set up for that. And there are other materials that it, that committee has created at earthquakecountry.org slash accessibility. And it's important that when you plan your earthquake drills too, that you're thinking about inclusive uh, inclusivity. So make sure you're involving members, all members of your community and your organization in the planning and, and make sure that you're asking them what is needed for them to fully participate in the drill with you and help to design a drill that has uh, all their, uh, uh, the accommodations that are, are needed, uh, as well as they're taking into account that you may have people in your workplace uh, or community uh, that uh, do have disabilities that uh, can be part of your planning team and may also uh, have personal support teams that will, that will be uh, working with them and supporting them during the drill. We do have new materials for children age four through nine, new like just in the last couple of weeks, including this really cute uh, coloring page for ShakeOut Day uh, and a lot of resources there for young people at rocketrules.org slash earthquake. So we're about to transition now uh, uh, we, uh, to uh, some uh, partners from the California Earthquake Authority. In one quiz, we can, uh, at Janet, we can kind of come in and, and introduce this next section. Just keep your camera off though, so that we keep uh, our sign language interpreter uh, in view. Thanks, Mark. Well, our quake quiz is what was the 
most costly earthquake in U.S. history. So if you have an answer for that, put it in the chat. And the first one to get the right answer will get a prize. Um, I'd like to move on here. Our good friends at the California Earthquake Authority are going to talk about mitigation. And we heard David Passy from FEMA talk about the importance of this. So I'd like to introduce to you now the CEO of the California Earthquake Authority, Glenn Pomeroy. Hello, everyone. My name is Glenn Pomeroy. I'm the CEO of the California Earthquake Authority. The CEA is, a, is the state's not-for-profit earthquake insurance provider formed after the Northridge earthquake uh, as a means to provide earthquake insurance protection for people on a not-for-profit basis. So we're here on the great California shakeout day to say, first of all, thank you for participating in this. It's the largest earthquake preparedness drill uh, in the world. Uh, uh, it's such an important opportunity for us all to come together and spend just a few minutes thinking about how we'll be better prepared for the next time the ground starts to shake. And from the CEA's perspective, we think there's a few things to keep in mind. First of all, consider having that financial protection in place for your home. Uh, earthquake insurance isn't covered in your homeowner's policy. And after a big disaster, the federal government's not gonna give you funds to rebuild your home. It's gonna be up to you. So earthquake insurance is very important in California, home to two thirds of the nation's earthquake risk. Whether you get it through the California Earthquake Authority or one of the other fine companies that's out there uh, selling this protection, uh, it's very important to, for you to consider uh, being adequately financially prepared. Secondly, uh, if you live in an older home, let's say one built around the time of World War II or before, or, or even, even all the way up through 1979, it's very important to consider taking steps now to strengthen your house so that it'll be better able to survive when the ground starts to shake. It's pretty easy to get a contractor over, get underneath the home, put in some braces and bolts. Doesn't take very long, doesn't cost that much, but it'll give you the peace of mind knowing that your home is no longer a disaster waiting to happen. You've strengthened your house and, and it's better prepared. Finally, know how to keep yourself safe. And this is what we've really been practicing throughout the day. Drop, cover, and hold. Ground starts to shake, drop to the ground immediately. Uh, cover, if you got a desk nearby, get under the desk. But if you don't, cover your head. Think about things that are gonna be falling from above, looking for your head and looking to cause injury. Drop to the ground, cover, and then just hold on till the ground starts stops shaking. Then it's safe to get up and move around. So, great California shakeout. Uh, keep yourself safe strengthen your house uh, and, and, and consider whether you're financially prepared to survive economically after the next big earthquake. Thank you for being involved in the Great California Shakeout and thank you for watching. Okay, thank you, Glenn. And I think the next up here from the California Earthquake Authority uh, should be uh, Pamela. Pamela Diaz, talking about the Earthquake Brace and Bolt program. Pamela, whenever you're ready. Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, Pamela Diaz, Community Relations Manager and Information Officer for the California Earthquake Authority. One of CEA's mission is to educate Californians to get prepared and worry less. And that is why year after year, we join millions of people in our golden state and the world in, uh, during this great earthquake drill, the great shakeout to practice what to do at the moment, the earthquake strikes, which is to develop uh, this muscle memory uh, to drop cover and hold on or lock, cover, and hold on for people with mobility devices. Also, as part of the preparedness to survive and recover from a damaging earthquake is ensuring that older homes, especially those built before 1980, are strengthened with a seismic retrofit. Uh, that process sounds more intimidating than it actually is. Uh, in most cases, it takes about two days to complete. And we, through our Earthquake Brace and Bolt program, offer grants of up to $3,000 for qualifying homeowners statewide. And now through our new supplemental program, uh, we are offering additional assistance for low income households to help to pay for the entire cost of the retrofit. So 
you have the information on the screen, the registration period to participate and apply for a grant starts next Wednesday, October 27, and runs through December 1st. And you can find more details on the pages that you see on the screen uh, by visiting earthquakeraceball.com. Or if you like more information about your house types and and more details about the California Residential Mitigation Program, you can visit strengthenmyhouse.com. And you can also get more information on the number on your screen. We also offer this uh, information in Spanish, uh, and I can do a little translation for our listeners uh, right now. Eh, estamos tratando de ayudar a que los californianos estén preparados para poder sobrevivir y recuperarse de un terremoto que puede ocurrir en cualquier momento en nuestro estado. Y nosotros en el California Earthquake Authority, aparte de practicar en el día del Grain Shakeout, lo que es drop, cover, and hold on, o agacharse, cubrirse y sujetarse, también queremos instar a la comunidad a que sepa que deben por fortalecer sus casas, sobre todo aquellas casas antiguas que fueron construidas antes de 1900 80. Y nosotros estamos ofreciendo a través del programa Earthquake Race and Vault eh, subvenciones para poder pagar por el costo de, de este fortalecimiento de viviendas antisísmico. Pueden obtener más información en EarthquakeRaceVault.com. Tendremos subvenciones para personas de bajos ingresos. Y empieza el registro el próximo 27 de octubre hasta el primero de diciembre. Por favor, inscríbanse, regístrense en earthquakepresentbolt.com o obtengan más información en strengthenmyhouse.com. Tenemos asistencia en español también. Muchas gracias y sigamos con este gran terremoto, el Great Shakeout. Thank you very much. Pamela, could you please introduce the video we're about to see? Yes, of course. Uh, as part of Very our quickly. commitment, <laughs> as part of our commitment, we we uh, hosted our earthquake drill virtually last Friday, and here is a little quick video to show how we all we want to show people that we at CEA take earthquake safety seriously. Of course, we are uh, in the uh, are in the earthquake safety business, so it's really important that we know what to do, and that our friends and family know what to do to drop, cover, and hold on. Because we know that California is earthquake country and an earthquake can happen at any moment in any part of our state. And um, as a matter of fact, we're getting right now an alert media. We should be all getting an alert media uh, telling us that we have to start this drill right now. And for that, Mark Tuhi, please take it away. This is an earthquake drill. Right now, drop, cover, and hold on. Drop to the floor now. During a large earthquake, the ground might shake strongly and knock you down. Cover your head and neck with your arms. If you can, take cover under something sturdy to protect from objects that can be thrown across the room. If you can't get under something, Stay low. If you use a walker or wheelchair, lock them in place and protect your head and neck with your arms. Hold on to your shelter and head and neck until the shaking stops. Now look around. What objects might fall or be thrown at you that you should secure in place before a real earthquake? Finally, a strong earthquake may cause a tsunami. If you are near the ocean during the earthquake, drop, cover, and hold on. Then quickly walk to high ground after the shaking stops. This earthquake drill is over. Thank you, CEA staff, for participating in the great shakeout drill. So that was a little bit preview for the drill we're all going to be doing together coming up at 1021. In fact, the uh, audio that you just heard will sound very, very familiar. And we're actually going to move ahead now uh, to, uh, I'm going to stop sharing because 
Trevin Reese from Ready America. Are you ready to uh, kind of give us a live demonstration? I want to spotlight you. Uh, actually, I'm going to turn I'm Mark off here. the... Yeah, just one second. All right. So, Trevin, could you introduce yourself and where you are and what you're inside of? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Mark, for having me here. Uh, so I'm Trevin Reese with Ready America. So we are here at XCOM uh, with our Big Shaker Earthquake Simulator, as you guys can see that behind me. Uh, we have our table displayed with uh, some of our products here, so I can show you guys that. Here with some of the Ready America products, our backpacks. Um, and some of the fastening straps that we have to secure your space. So any of your top heavy furniture, uh, all of your breakables, any items that can turn into projectiles, it's important to secure those. So I'm gonna turn the camera over here. So that way I can show you guys inside the Big Shaker Earthquake Simulator and we can go through a live earthquake. So this is gonna mimic the 6.9 North Ridge earthquake. So this is gonna last us for about 17 seconds. We really want to do when we uh, are at home, especially with COVID. A lot of people are working from the home, so they have their workstations set up at their offices. So it's really important to go home and identify those items as the was saying. So go home and do a hazard hunt. Identify top heavy furniture, for example, the entertainment centers here. It's important to secure those down. Uh, additionally, all the items on the shelves if you have your crystals your glass your china secure those so we have our clay cold putty which is a uh, slow putty material that you can use to secure to the bottom of any of your breakables top heavy uh including bases so items up to 40 pounds and one pack of that can secure up to 40 items and you'll find these in home depot lowe's walmart amazon.com all major retailers so i'll show you guys how you actually get that secured so Right here with me, I have this little ball of this putty. So all we simply want to do to secure any of these breakable items is roll this into little strips right here, put at the base of the items right here, okay? It's really important to put these at the base and give it time to form that bond once you secure it down. So we're gonna put that right here under on top of our drop cover and hold on table. And so once you push down on that, give it a little twist to form that strong bond. And if you do need to remove it, when you're done, it doesn't damage any furniture. Uh, you can just always simply twist at the base and remove. Never twist at the top as it could break the stem or break the glass. So always remember at the base. And it's important too for those top heavy furniture items to secure those to the top or the sides of the cabinets, depending on the height of them. So this is that flexible nylon strap. So it allows a little bit of play uh, as well as having the 3M adhesive here to attach to the furniture and the industrial strength Velcro right here. So you can remove it and then re-secure it somewhere else. So it's really important to make sure that we take those necessary steps as well as have an emergency kit. So I have one of our two person emergency kits right down there locked in pretty good. So hopefully that doesn't go anywhere. So having minimum three days worth of emergency food, drinking water, first aid supplies. Remember, we got the drop cover and hold on. It's an earthquake now. Like that. All right. <laughs> it's a very silent earthquake. It is a very silent earthquake. <laughs> It, was, it wasn't very silent here. I can promise you that. <laughs> I bet. So uh, as you can see on the floor, typically all this stuff is not going to be This is going to be all of your glass items, all of your breakables. So that's why it's so important to make sure that you guys are continuing to secure those items. Don't just buy the straps and then leave them next to the cabinets that you guys have. Make sure you actually go home, install these items, there's so many steps that we can take, especially with your TVs. We have a universal flat screen strap as well. If your TV is uh, not, not mounted to the wall, it's not only earthquake safety, but it's also child safety. Children like to climb on furniture, so it's really important we secure that. So thank you, Mark. Well, thank you, Trevin. I know we're just one minute yes. ahead of our schedule, just barely. Um, if anyone has any questions, 
We can type them quickly in the chat here. We can maybe get one in for Trevin. But thank you, Trevin. This and was Jason, awesome. I would like to just also uh, acknowledge Ready America that every year since uh, the beginning of ShakeOut, Ready America has provided a big shaker setup like this uh, early morning, usually when we've been together live, uh, starting at 4.30 for news interviews. And it's just a great tradition and great to have you here in the big shaker today, even though we're not having that type of event. And also thank you for setting up the big shaker for some media interviews in SoCal and the Bay Area over the last weeks. Uh, okay, so, and, and just, also Mark. that great new trailer that you have there <clears throat> that you've added in the table yep. so that people can really practice drop cover hold on really yep. uh, uh excellent so we're going to go ahead and move along and it's my pleasure to introduce Lori Nazura with uh california office of emergency services deputy director for planning preparedness and prevention Lori, because you're not having a slide you definitely can turn your your camera on up to you and uh, we'll both, well, everybody be, will be able to see both you and then and the interpreter. Thank you. Unfortunately, it's not letting me turn my camera on, um, but maybe that's fortunate for you. I so can make I that will, happen too. <laughs> I will just go ahead and uh, we'll, we'll highlight the interpreter. Thank you so much for your services. Good morning. I'm happy to be here with you today. And the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, or Cal OES, is pleased to partner with each of the presenting organizations and agencies in preparing and protecting Californians every day. Some of what I'm going to share with you today it was already mentioned by other presenters, but bears repeating. Shakeout is not just a 60-second chance each year to practice earthquake protective measures. Shakeout is a reminder for all of us to be prepared every day. Some ways that you can prepare yourself and your family is to download the free My Shake app from the Apple Store or Google Play so you can receive earthquake warnings. Cal OES sponsors this app developed by UC Berkeley. It draws from the Shake Alert system to provide individuals, businesses, and public safety services potentially moments to minutes of warning before shaking arrives, depending on where they are located in reference to the earthquake epicenter. Dr. Jen Strauss from the UC Berkeley Seismology Lab will show you the app in a moment and help you download it onto your phone. Another step toward preparedness is to have a family plan for sheltering in place evacuating and reuniting. Discuss today where your family will meet up in the event they are separated before or during an earthquake. Have the phone number of a relative or friends who don't live near you to communicate through because as David Passy from FEMA mentioned, sometimes the telecommunications infrastructure will be impacted by an earthquake. Now, don't forget to check your go bag and stay box to see if any supplies need to be replenished or replaced. You don't have a go bag or a stay box yet? Today is the perfect time to start building one. You can find go bag and stay box lists on our website at earthquake.ca.gov. If you have kids, turn it into a scavenger hunt to help them find these items around your house. You probably have most of them already. And please don't forget your pets when you are packing your bag or your box. They will need food, water, a bowl, blanket, medications, vet records, and carrier. You'll also want a current photo of your animals and to make sure their tags are up to date in case they go missing. We just heard a presentation on how to secure items in your home and workplace so they don't fall on you during shaking causing in injury. And if you own a pre-1980 wood framed home in an earthquake hazard area, check into the Ber Earthquake 
Brace and Bolt program just mentioned by our friends at the California Earthquake Authority. Finally, let's remember the reason we're all here today. Let's practice drop, cover, hold on, or if you're in a mobility assistive device, lock, cover, and hold on to develop that muscle memory so that you and your family, neighbors and friends, know how to protect yourselves during an earthquake. You don't have to wait for the great shakeout to do this. You can practice it any day of the week, month, or year to make sure you are ready at a moment's notice. Thanks for the opportunity to speak. Sorry, I couldn't get my camera turned on. Everyone have a great day and practice drop cover and hold on. Lori, thank you very much for those great comments, very thorough and uh, uh, take an opportunity to uh, mention the, uh, uh, make sure we're putting links in the chat to the Cal OES resources, uh, including at earthquake.ca.gov and the uh, uh, caloes.ca.gov, look for the earthquake program there. Uh, Cal OES supports the Earthquake Country Alliance uh, that is organizing ShakeOut in California and, and so many of our activities at earthquakecountry.org slash seven steps is where you can find a lot of the details about the great advice that Lori was presenting. Thank you again, Lori. Uh, we want to move, to, uh, because we have had some people join us, we want to just uh, let everybody know again that if you have questions, please do put them into the chat. Uh, and uh, we probably should remind people that uh, I think it's just done that. Uh, thank you to um, uh, just looking at the ASL interpretation instruction there. Although I think we figured it out to where it can be viewed in YouTube too now. Uh, but mentioning questions in chat, do we, and just for a moment, uh, take a couple questions. Do we have any questions we want to pose to any of our presenters or anyone on the? Um, and we know it takes time to type your responses here in YouTube chat. So we'll hang out here, like Mark said, for a minute or so. We have a question from Bruce Morgan. He asks, what do you do if you're in a wheelchair and can't get under a table? Bruce, excellent question. Uh, the lock, cover, hold on guidance that Laurie just mentioned. Um, we actually will be showing uh, in just a few moments uh, uh, instructions for what to do during an earthquake for everyone. Uh, leading up to the drill time, including some uh, pictures, Bruce, from your facility where we filmed at uh, your prior facility. So uh, thank you, Bruce, for making sure that uh, that that gets asked and it will be covered in just a few minutes. I know Bruce. <laughs> Any other questions? And I know Bruce too. Thank yeah. you, Bruce. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> That's all I see in the chat at this time. All right, great. Well, let's go ahead and move then. As Lori mentioned, up next is Dr. Jennifer Strauss from the Berkeley Seismo Lab. Uh, Jennifer, are you going to be showing something on screen or can, you, can your camera be off uh, to allow the ASO interpreter to be seen? Yeah, I just turned it on to say hello and introduce myself and then I'll turn it uh, back off. Yeah, um, okay. So um, my name is Jen Strauss. I'm with UC Berkeley and I am the product manager for the MyShake app. Um, this app, as Lori mentioned, is sponsored by the Governor's Office of Emergency Services and is part of Earthquake Warning California's statewide warning system that aims to give people a warning that an earthquake, earthquake. started. Drop cover. Shaking is headed their Sorry, way. Lana and that they should drop cover and hold on. So here we have a video of what a real alert would look like coming in on your phone. So I'm go ahead. start it here. Okay, here we go. Earthquake, drop cover, hold on. Shaking expected. So the alert would come as an audio alert and then of course give you the visual reminding you to drop cover hold on. Um, it would then go to a map that shows a temporary bullseye of where the earthquake is estimated to be. Since this system is powered by ShakeAlert, um, ShakeAlert is what does the estimation of where the earthquake location is and what the magnitude is. 
So as the earthquake progresses and finishes and scientists have opportunity to further investigate it, the location may change a bit and the magnitude may change a bit over time. Once the information is certified, that bullseye will be replaced by a normal uh, colored disc to indicate where the true verified earthquake is. Users who have the app installed with location services set to always on will receive these warnings powered by ShakeAlert, given that they are in the correct location. Warnings will be delivered for estimated magnitude four and a half or higher quakes only to users in the light to heavy shaking regions. So if you're farther away from the estimated earthquake location, you would not necessarily receive a warning, even if you feel a little bit of shaking. Today, we'll be doing a test of the system as part of the Great Shakeout. If you don't have the app already, please go to the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store and search for My Shake. Once you have it downloaded, you're going to want to set your location services to on and have the app running to improve your chance of receiving the test alert. The reason why I say improving your chance of receiving the test alert is because this test alert might not be received by everyone, and it will definitely not come in immediately at 1021 for most people. And this is by design. The test message is sent at a low priority because we want to reserve the quicker, higher priority pathways just in case a real earthquake were to come in during the test. Um, this has certainly happened before when they tested their system in uh, Mexico City many, many years ago. So we have to leave that opportunity open. The test quake will read as a magnitude four and a half earthquake located at West Coast USA. Um, this is the smallest magnitude event for which you could get a warning. But remember, this test drill is a great opportunity to practice drop, cover, hold on where you happen to be. Um, so I hope that you will all join me. You will all have the app downloaded on your phone, get those locations turned on, and hopefully we'll all be able to work together to have a great shakeout drill experience. And that's all I have. We do have some questions for you, or at least one I saw uh, in the chat regarding earthquake early warning in my shake. Believe. There's a question that's, uh, I downloaded the MyShake app, but not getting any activity from the app. Okay, um, are you getting uh, activity on the map? Do you see a bunch of colored dots or listings representing earthquakes around the world? We may not be able to get a quick response to that yeah, question that's true. Um, through there. Um, so normally there's not a ton of activity happen because obviously earthquakes don't happen at every moment of the day. By default, the global earthquake map only shows magnitude six and above earthquakes that have happened worldwide in the past week or so. Um, you will not receive an early warning notification unless you are in the light, heavy shaking area for an estimated magnitude four and a half or above earthquake. Otherwise, right. if you want to have more information that comes in more often, you can set a custom notification and that will alert you about earthquakes that have happened after the fact a few minutes after the earthquake has happened. Um, and that pulls from the United States Geological Survey's Earthquake Notification Service, which again, mostly focuses on magnitude four and a half or above earthquakes worldwide and can process lower earthquakes more locally. If you have any questions, please email yeah. myshake-info at berkeley.edu. We have people standing by to um, answer your questions over email as well. Hey, Janet, uh, one comment I'd like to add that because I, when I talk to people, they often are confused that they have earthquake apps that maybe they've had for many years and they think that is earthquake early warning. And there are many apps that will tell you where the earthquake was that gets a signal from the USGS after they've um, quickly determined that an earthquake has happened. 
that's something you can get worldwide. You can set your settings. That is not what earthquake early warning is. It's not what my shake. Um, well, it's, it's not all that, that my shake provides. Uh, my shake is providing a warning that the waves are on their way to you. Not that the earthquake happened a few minutes ago. Exactly. Yeah. As uh, Dr. DeGroote mentioned earlier today, there are several official licensed operators of the ShakeAlert early warning system. And MyShake is just one of them. On phones, you have the WIA system, you have QuakeAlert, and you also have um, the San Diego um, smartphone app that incorporates with their standard uh, resilient yeah information. Um, there are other licensed operators as well working in more uh, lifeline spaces, um, but those are the only groups that are providing this early warning service where you could receive information before, during, or just after the quake happened. Um, you can go to yeah. shakealert.org to see a list of those approved uh, groups that are providing early warning services. But all other apps are simply pulling from the post-earthquake earthquake notification service. And I'll point out that one app that you did not mention just now because it is no longer uh, uh, in service is the ShakeAlert LA app, right? That is correct. So there is a question in the in the point in the in the chat about that. Shake Alert LA no longer is in service. So yes, you need my shake or uh, one of the other apps that you, you might find there, or you might get it as um, Jen mentioned through your uh, wireless emergency alert. So in fact, it's a great time to make sure you have my shake right now uh, to download it, get it ready to perhaps get that test message. Um, We'll go ahead and move on. Here we're going to start moving towards drill time. Well, you know, you know, one one thing, real quick, Mark, if we can. Uh, someone asked about resources for schools, and uh, I think you know, explaining my shake is hard. We can't always have Jen with us to tell us how it all works. Uh, maybe Jen or even if Bob, if you're online with us, can you tell us where people can go to get resources uh, for shake alert resources and explaining earthquake giving warning for school settings or other types of educational environments? Sure, what we can do, Jason, is we can put a link to the Incorporated Research Institutions for Seismology or IRIS, and they have developed a considerable number of resources and also have a lot of animations that could be used to explain everything about, about the Shakelet Earthquake Early Warning System, but also a lot of other concepts related to earthquakes. So I'll pop that in the chat box here in a second. Excellent, thank you, Bob. Uh, and also, I think you linked to that from shakealert.org, right? Uh, they can probably find things there too. Okay, so we've heard a lot about what to do before earthquakes and getting prepared. We've heard about, uh, and, and we've seen different ways of practicing, and, and we saw the California Earthquake Authority do a practice earthquake drill. Uh, and now we're going to build up to, uh, to in 10 minutes, uh, 1021 drill time, uh, kind of unofficially, officially, uh, we really encourage you to drill within the time that makes the most sense for you. But if you are with us, of course, drill with us at 1021. And great shakeout earthquake drills are all about that. And in fact, there are millions of people, more than 7.6 million Californians, more than 15.5 uh, million people across the country and over 31 million or so people worldwide this year participating. Not all today, but many today. And you might wonder, okay, well, why do we say what we, uh, our key message about drop, cover, hold on, and also uh, lock, cover, hold on, we're going to cover all of these aspects. And it really is a strong consensus among many uh, uh, scientists, government officials, urban search and rescue firefighters who even go to other countries and, and, uh, and, and dig through rubble to find people that if you put yourself in a protected space, that you're less likely to be injured uh, or trapped and, and be more able to be found and rescued. It also prevents you from being thrown to the ground and prevents injury from falling or flying items, especially those that you might encounter if you were trying to run run outside or moving around too much uh, in, in, uh, inside. And so one thing I wanna point out is that if you can't drop down, 
um, and get back up again on your own, don't go down on the ground. Uh, and make sure that people around you know that that is not your plan, that they shouldn't be pulling you down with them. Uh, if, you know, really talk about this in advance. And we do have this graphic as shown here. And I'm going to go into this in more details. For uh, many people who are able to get down and, uh, and make themselves a small target, it is about dropping where you are, not moving somewhere to find that perfect table, because moving is when people get more injured. They're walking through broken glass, perhaps if they don't have shoes on, things are falling and flying across the room. So drop onto your hands and knees where you are. And right away, cover your head and neck with one arm and hand, at least to that, you know, you're protecting your, your, your head and neck, you bend over, protect your vital organs. And if there is a sturdy table or desk nearby, crawl underneath it for additional shelter. If there is not, get next to a wall or something that's going to provide sideways protection so that you don't have things coming at you from all directions, that they're coming from one side. It's just you want to limit how you might get injured during the earthquake. And then if you are underneath something or can grab onto something, hold on to it and to, uh, to that shelter until the shaking stops. You might need to move with it shelter if it's very heavy and you can't and you're, you're holding on to it does not stop it itself. And if you're not under a shelter, hold on to your head and neck with both arms and hands. It's all about protecting you from the things that cause the most injuries during earthquakes. <coughs> now, if you happen to use a cane and you are able to get down, bring it with you because that might be what helps you get back up again. Or if you, you might sit down, keep it with you still. If you don't want it to be moving far away from you during the earthquake. If you use a power wheelchair, try to move up against a interior wall first as shown here. Set the lock of, or just it may even be a break or it may be even turning off the power chair so that it won't roll around during the earthquake. And uh, as shown here. And then if you have something you can put up over your head, this is the, the guidance. So it's all about what's possible for your situation, situational awareness, making yourself uh, less prone to be hit by objects that might cause injury. People using a manual wheelchair or what may be called a rollator, kind of just another way of showing uh, uh, like a walker that may also have uh, locks on or brakes. Same thing. You may move towards a wall. You may uh, not have time. So you want to get down. You want to stay seated as much as possible. Cover your head and neck as much as you can. And if you're using a walker that doesn't have uh, kind of a lock, still you might sit down or you might even get down. If you can get down uh, onto your knees uh, uh, below the top of that walker so that if something falls on it, it doesn't hit you. Some other settings, if you're, of course, in a high rise, you want to move away from the windows. The buildings are designed to have some sway to them. You don't want to be very near the outside and perhaps get thrown through that window. Move away from the windows as quickly as you can, then drop or lock, uh, as uh, depending on the situation, cover and hold on. If you're in bed, don't go somewhere else. Just stay in bed and put a pillow over your head. Uh, lay face down, as kind of shown in this image here. If you're in a stadium or theater, uh, as best as you can, get as low as possible below the height of the chairs. Again, so things are hitting the chairs and not you. If you're in a store, a uh, regular shopping store, you might want to get closer to the rack so that things aren't flying farther before they hit you. You're actually right up next to it. You might even, in a, in, like a, in a warehouse situation, get into that first level rack so that the things up above don't fall down onto you. Now, here's a really uh, fun way of hearing about this with a, a partner of ours, uh, showed the resources earlier. This is uh, Rocket. He's going to tell us uh, this is information we provide to, uh, to uh, in our materials for grades uh, kindergarten through third grade. And here's another way of hearing a summary of what I just shared. But what do we do if we're at home and an earthquake is actually happening? That's easy. Drop, cover, and hold on. Drop to a safe place and hold on. If you aren't near a table, get against a wall or away from anything that could fall. Get down, cover your head and neck, and hold on. If you're in bed, turn face down to protect your belly. 
Cover your head and neck with a pillow, and don't leave the bed. If you're in a wheelchair, lock your wheels so your chair can't roll around in the shaking. Get as small as you can and cover your head and neck with something strong, like a book. Now, how about if an earthquake happens when you're outside? In that case, stay away from buildings, windows, trees, telephone poles, or anything that could fall on you. Get on the ground and cover your head and neck. Again, there's a lot of great materials at rocketrules.org, not only on earthquake safety, but many others, uh, many other aspects of, uh, and uh, different hazards in, uh, on uh, many programs that they've developed. It's a nonprofit out of uh, Southern California, and we really appreciate our partnership. Okay, so there's time, I believe, for some questions here right before we get to the drill, if we have any on what was just covered in terms of how to protect yourself during earthquakes. Uh, we have a, sort of a question. If you're in your car, move from trees and power lines and stay in your vehicle. Great point, yes. And I'll, I'll mention again too at earthquakecountry.org slash step five. We can put, uh, we may have the link there already. Lots of different uh, uh, guidance uh, on what to do in different situations. I mentioned that we have videos uh, on what to do when driving um, also. And uh, 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 that's a really great point. Thank you very much. Uh, Margaret asked, why are we saying face down in bed? We used to say on your side, face down leaves your spine exposed. I think it's a, a matter of being more stable and not uh, moving, you know, being prone to roll around. That is an interesting point. I'm not sure that um, uh, when that, if that changed or why that, uh, um, I think we should definitely look into that about uh, what is a better option and what the research shows. Cynthia. Well, ah, good question about doorways there. Yeah, thank you, Sharon. Your vital organs, the way being face down, you, you do protect those vital organs just like when you do when you're under a table. Yeah, I, I would love to, to just briefly mention the doorways before we get to the drill. Uh, doorways don't protect you from anything. That's the, really the, the quickest answer. That It's an old wives tale or, or urban legend that the, somehow the building would fall down around the door that would be with still standing. Uh, you know, it's about four inches wide and the whole building, if it were to fall, would fall into that space. You probably can't hold yourself up. And it, if you're a couple people in the room, you're not all be able to get into that doorway. So that hasn't been official messaging since the eighties. In fact, drop cover hold on has been uh, for that long. It's just people keep talking about it. All right. So we're coming up here. I'm going to just going to, so if you happen to be watching with headphones on, please disconnect them. So when you drop cover hold on, you don't take your whole computer down with you. And as I'm looking at the time, uh, I'm going to play an audio file that will give us narration about when to start and when to stop. Uh, coming up on 1021, everybody. So while we can't see you, we hope that you will actually do the drop cover hold on drill. And uh, let me go ahead and start that. This is an earthquake drill. Right now, drop, cover, and hold on. Drop to the floor now. During a large earthquake, the ground might shake strongly and knock you down. Cover your head and neck with your arms. If you can, take cover under something sturdy to protect from objects that can be thrown across the room. If you can't get under something, stay low. If you use a walker or wheelchair, lock them in place and protect your head and neck with your arms. Hold on to your shelter and head and neck until the shaking stops. Now look around. What objects might fall or be thrown at you that you should secure in place before a real earthquake? Finally, a strong earthquake may cause a tsunami. If you are near the ocean during the earthquake, drop, cover, and hold on. Then quickly walk to high ground after the shaking stops. This earthquake drill is over. 
Okay, everybody, come back up or uh, you can stop covering your head and neck if you opted to stay seated in doing that, which, as was mentioned, is a, uh, a, uh, a way to adapt the messaging for your situation. Uh, uh, I see people are commenting that they got the test alert. I, I did as I was down at the crowd and it happened. So uh, you can comment on that too. Uh, you had to have had the MyShake uh, app uh, uh, configured, and it may not reach everyone, as Jen had mentioned, because of the level of setting that it was set for, so it wouldn't override an actual earthquake. Um, I see we did get some other questions kind of about earth, uh, self-protective action. Was there any that we should go back to and answer right now? Um, I ride a motorcycle, but I've never been on the bike during a quake. Any special info? Yeah, so just like driving, uh, the, the uh, part of a motorcycle, of course, is uh, 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 shocks and, and suspension. So you may not notice a minor earthquake. You may see people around you reacting. Uh, you definitely want to come to a stop and try not to be under something or on or either on or under a bridge, move a few more seconds uh, further uh, so that you aren't, uh, and just make sure that other people are kind of mindful that you have come to a stop. Don't just stop in the middle of the road. I think it's kind of a similar guidance, but um, and wait for the shaking to stop and then be mindful for aftershocks. And of course, all of this is, of course, there could be another earthquake at any time, especially after a large earthquake. How about other transport services like trains or buses? Are they equipped with MyShake? I'll uh, let, um, uh, that not with MyShake, right? But maybe, um, Bob, do you want to answer that question? Currently, the, the, not, not within the actual buses themselves, but we have a few partners, BART, Metrolink, and also LA Metro, who have incorporated ShakeAlert into several of their buildings and other infrastructure. They're continuing to make improvements all the time. So this is where they're doing it. And actually LA Metro is doing a drill today um, in all of the buildings uh, for, shake, uh, for ShakeOut. Bob, can you say a little bit more about what it might look like in the future when buildings and, and other uh, locations have uh, the system built in? Sure, and I think one of the key things to, to mention here is, is the whole notion of automated actions. I mean, it's really great and it's very important and critical for people to get alerts on their, on their personal devices, on cell phones, for example. But we're going to see a lot of impact of ShakeAlert in automated action. So this could be buildings where PA systems could be activated. Other systems could be set off without human intervention to protect people and to protect other resources. In the case of an LA Metro, of course, it's a critical lifeline to move materials after an earthquake. So they wanna make sure that they can get back up and running as quickly as possible. So anything that they can do without human intervention in just a few seconds will allow them to get the trains operating uh, you know, in, in a matter of, a matter of hours or, or less. Um, and really with ShakeAlert, we are learning new things all the time of wonderful applications that could be used where buildings themselves are, are acting on their own to keep people safe uh, after an earthquake. We have another question. Can we predict earthquakes minutes earlier? Bob or Jen? So um, at, at this time, uh, no, we, we can't predict earthquakes. We, we were doing a great technological feat of science just to be able to give you information about earthquakes within the first seconds of them starting. Um, you have to remember that earthquakes are geological processes and the time frames that the earth works at are in the you know hundreds of thousands of years. And so a human time scale of predicting an earthquake over a couple of minutes is, um, it is a very different uh, animal, I would say. Um, so right now we have earthquake 
early warning, and that is a great tool. Um, the USGS also has a product for aftershock forecasting, because just because one earthquake happened doesn't mean that it's not going to be followed by several other earthquakes. And so that is a really good tool. It's not earthquake prediction, but it's giving you a good model of what to expect in the coming days and weeks after a large event. Hey, Jen, there are, I have a number of comments about uh, people who did not get the alert. Can you, the test alert, could you just say briefly again, uh, kind of why that may be the case? Yes. Yeah, so as I mentioned during uh, the, the pre-drill information, the test alert is sent by a very different uh, protocol than the main alert line. It is sent at what's called low priority. So um, the the phone messaging system just kind of tries one time. It's not even really best effort level. Um, and so if there was a connectivity information, um, <clears throat> if there was an issue with um, the phone registration on the back end, um, those could be several ways that the message could get dropped. Um, if you do experience something in particular and would like us to follow up, we're happy if you email us at myshake-info at berkeley.edu. But um, the real alerts are sent on a much higher priority channel um, and pushed through with critical alerts. And so um, don't, don't worry that necessarily because you yeah. did not receive a test alert that, that it's broken. Thank you, Jen. And just before we move on uh, to answer one question I see back in the chat, uh, uh, was asked, why is running outside not a good idea? Uh, it is because when people run outside, they, uh, especially with the quality of our buildings, are likely to uh, that, uh, get injured. Small items fall off of buildings, brick buildings, especially that brick facades often crumble when the whole building itself remains standing, but brick and, uh, and other things on the, uh, and glass comes off of buildings. We do not recommend that you move very far at all and definitely do not run outside that in, in past Earth, California earthquakes, that is when people have been killed, um, actually not even just injured. So uh, we know it's kind of, it could be scary you know, everything's shaking and you want to, to get out. Um, but uh, the recommendation is that you get under instead as best as you can under something for, for shelter. Uh, we're going to go ahead and move on, keep the questions coming. We'll come back to them. Um, and uh, I'm going to turn over to Jason and just tell me next, Jason, when you're ready. Oh, sure. Absolutely. And again, glad everyone's here. Uh, please put your questions, comments in the chat. We're watching. We are here to help. And what we want to talk about now, though, is what is so crucial to think about in the minutes and even those immediate hours after an earthquake. And this ties back into some things you could have already done to prepare for earthquakes, like secure your space and organize supplies and think about what your communications plans might be after an earthquake. So once the shaking is over, you know exactly what to do, or maybe some things haven't moved as much as they could have if they uh, were not secured. So this is why we say keep shoes and a flashlight in a bag attached to your bed not just under your bed, attached to the bed. You need those shoes because that can help protect your feet if you're in bed during an earth, when an earthquake strikes and there may be some sharp or other types of objects that could cut your feet. And a flashlight to help you see in the dark if the earthquake again happens at night and you happen to be in bed. Next slide, please. And turning off your gas is so important. I just wanna draw everyone's attention to the lower right graphic. If the little valve is up, like this, that means that the gas is on and you can just take a simple wrench to turn it off. You should only turn off the gas if you smell it um, or hear kind of a whizzing sound, but especially if you smell it, if you smell gas. I think we all kind of know what that smells like. It's not the most pleasant smell, but that's purposeful. That's what that is supposed to smell like if it's leaking. So the gas is on if the valve is up like this, the gas is off if the valve is at 90 degrees. And you can use a wrench just to do that. Next slide, please. And for small fires, uh, I have to say that I, I love when I get to test using a fire extinguisher because it's always such a great reminder of how these work, how they can be a little heavy, and um, sometimes too. And I think we even have a little video, Mark. Do we still have time to play that video of how to use a yeah. fire extinguisher? 
Here. Here we go. Before using one, make sure that you have a clear escape, you are familiar with the operating instructions of the fire extinguisher, and that the fire extinguisher you have is suitable for the fire you're facing. Before using the extinguisher on a fire, look at the fire class symbols on the front label to make sure the extinguisher you have is suitable for the type of fire you're facing. The most common classes of fires are A, B, C, and K. Class A fires involve common combustibles like wood, paper, and tires. Class B fires involve flammable liquids like gasoline and petroleum oil. Class C ratings involve energized equipment or things that are plugged in like appliances, computers, televisions, and electric machinery. Class K fires involve cooking oils and greases like vegetable fats. Once you've determined that the extinguisher is the correct type for the hazard, proceed to operate the extinguisher using the pass technique to control and extinguish the fire. First, hold the extinguisher upright and pull the pin. Next, stand 8 to 10 feet from the fire and aim the nozzle at the base of the fire. Do not get too close or aim the nozzle too high. Once the nozzle is aimed at the base of the fire, squeeze the levers together to begin discharge of the fire extinguishing agent. Maintain your distance from the fire and sweep the nozzle from side to side, sweeping 3 to 6 inches beyond the right and left edges of the fire. Discharge the extinguisher until contents are exhausted to prevent reignition. Move around the fire to confirm it is completely extinguished. Thank you. And you know, fires happen because of gas leaks like we talked about, but also things that can spark electric electronic items that can spark um, during shaking as well. So knowing how to use a fire extinguisher is super important. Tsunami, our last bit here. If you're at the coast and you feel shaking, any shaking can mean, if you're at the coast, that a tsunami is imminent. Don't second guess it. Don't try to hope there might not be one because of X, Y, and Z. Just play it safe, better to be safe than sorry, and get to high ground or go inland. The recommendation is typically at least two miles inland if you think a tsunami is on the way. And if you're able to walk quickly or have someone assist you in getting to that safe space if need be as well. I encourage everyone to go to tsunamizone.org slash California for more information about tsunamis such as tsunami evacuation maps and how to even plan your own route to, and just to know what zone you're in. As we say, get to know your zone. Maybe you live, work, or travel where tsunamis are common. It's like shake out for tsunamis, tsunamizone.org. Thanks everyone for your time. I'm sorry, I didn't notice that the interpreters had changed. Uh, okay, we're uh, set back up again. Okay, so um, uh, also after an earthquake uh, is when you can apply training you have received. So we really encourage everyone to look into a local program maybe offered by your fire department or local emergency management agency. Uh, one very commonly uh, known is the community emergency response team uh, that you can get uh, really excellent training uh, covering a lot of what we've been talking about and how to respond to help your neighbors, to help yourself, to help your family, uh, to help others who are injured, as well as to put out the small fires. You get to, uh, you know, really practice with an actual fire and a fire extinguisher. Uh, and uh, so look for that if you aren't cert trained. In fact, that's a good question. If you are cert trained, say so in the chat. It'd be fun to see uh, how many of those we have here. Uh, I know many of us, myself included, um, who have been speaking today are CERT trained. Uh, other, uh, there are other programs. The city of Los Angeles has the Ready Your LA Neighborhood program. There's the Map Your Neighborhood program where you get together with your neighbors, similar to what uh, uh, Los Angeles, actually uh, Los Angeles has a, kind of built on that program, kind of talk about what the resources are in your community and your, really in your block. Uh, and also, who? Uh, what are the vulnerabilities? Who are people who may need additional assistance, young people uh, or others after an earthquake or other disaster? Uh, there's the Neighbor Fest program where you get together for a, a party on your block and talk about earthquake and other preparedness. FEMA has a program until, called Until Help Arrives, a bit sh uh, simpler perhaps than CERT, but you, you do uh, learn some really key life-saving actions that you can take to help um, 
people until other help does arrive. Uh, looks like we got some people answering about being cert trained. That's really great. Uh, I'm actually going to show a video from the city of Los Angeles on uh, a cert program that was in the news uh, about uh, a month ago. If there is a public emergency, the fire department is not coming. They have to go to the larger areas. We've gone complacent. If you lose power, your cell phone goes down, most people, I guarantee you, will not know what to do. In the city of Los Angeles, we have this dependency upon the professionals. Professional EMS, 911, police department, fire department. And what will happen after a disaster is they will be completely overwhelmed and immediately unable to fulfill the needs of the community. What we're doing with this program is using it as an introductory, getting people interested, getting neighborhoods interested, and they can go to those higher levels. We have learned uh, how to triage. That means that if there were a large e public event, we would be able to discern who needs immediate, who can wait, and who's a walking wounded, and who cannot be helped. That's very important if you have, let's say, 50, 100, or more injuries, then you need to know who needs help. We are using people's front lawns to put down a victim, obviously a simulated victim, or a gas problem, or an electrical problem, or a water mains problem. These are citizens. They are citizens who are not used to doing search and rescue, but they have to be employed because they are the only bastion we have between us and the problems that occur after an earthquake. The Red Cross, uh, FEMA, they all say, be prepared for at least one week to three weeks minimum. With our neighborhood team program, what we're, is, what we're endeavoring to do is to get residents interested by giving them some of the basics of what they get in CERT. And as they get their skills up to speed, they can eventually move up to that CERT level. Okay. Well, thank you, Mark, for playing that video. And I think everyone can see the power of a great CERT team. I met some of my best friends in the CERT training I did in Long Beach, California. And it was one of the most memorable experiences I ever had. Right. Hey, is that an aftershock? Oh. Everybody, drop cover, hold on, lock cover, hold on. Always be ready. It could happen again. It could happen uh, and be even larger than the initial earthquake. It does happen uh, occasionally. And it in fact happened in 2019 with the Ridgecrest earthquake series or sequence where there was a 6.4 earthquake followed by a 7.1 the next day. So always be ready to protect yourself, perhaps when you're helping others uh, after an earthquake. and. Uh, in, in the immediate couple of days, so you may have many, many aftershocks or weeks, depending on the size of the earthquake, but they really can go on for months to even years. Uh, they just get less frequent. Uh, so a little fun surprise there. I don't know if anybody really uh, got down again, but we uh, appreciate your, your uh, uh, following along. So uh, we have another question here. And we really would like to hear from you either with questions or if you have any uh, uh, final um, kind of comments you'd like to share something you've learned today. Well, Mark, this is Janet Ruiz. And uh, one thing that I learned today was uh, to really look at my front door. Now, you know, I've made sure that, I do, that everything's strapped and I use quick putty and I, heavy mirrors aren't over my bed, uh, but I hadn't really thought about my front doorway, not only on the inside of the house, but also right outside. We tend to put cool things, you know, right out in front of our front door that could block us from getting out. So um, I encourage all of you to share something in the chat uh, that you have found today or thought about. Uh, we had a lot of questions about the MyShake 
app and the, the early warning and what do those seconds mean to us? So I think that tells us that that's a really uh, something that people are learning about and learning the value of. Um, so share again in the Q&A and the chat, uh, what are the things that you've learned? I also want to make sure everyone knew that the answer to the North, the answer to what was the um, most expensive earthquake was the Northridge earthquake in 1994. So be prepared financially as well as physically for earthquakes. Yeah, I believe, uh... Uh, I know there were there was a lot of people answering Northridge, a lot of people answering the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, and I believe Northridge was actually about 40 billion dollars plus in in losses, whereas Loma Prieta was uh, over 10 billion. So it was quite a big difference. That's that's correct, and you know part of the reason for that is the population in the Northridge area. So when we have these denser population areas, uh, you're going to have more loss, uh, which is a great reason to be uh, looking at the CERT program. Uh, that was a great video and so helpful. Maybe some of you don't even realize that you can do these things or other people in your community don't understand how they can uh, participate and be a part of it. So it's, it's really helpful. Um, all the information today was just amazing. Um, so do share in the chat. We like to know what you didn't know about so that we can help other people learn as well. And it does look like we're seeing a lot of good lessons that are uh, being shared here about getting the app and getting items to secure your space so things won't fall um, and um, there's a uh, comment about being in the, uh, in the shower. Really, again, it's, it's the situational awareness about what can you do to make yourself a smaller target for things that are falling or flying in the space that you're in. And that is not always going to be a one size fits all type of solution, depending on the unique environment that you might find yourself in. But it really does build on don't move, get down, make yourself small and get under something if you can. Uh, uh, it, it might sound like, oh, but what if that heavy thing falls on what I'm under? It's not as likely as the heavy thing falling on you because you're not under something. Uh, and uh, it's really what the experience of how people have gotten injured in the past that really gives us the, the guidance that we uh, talk about. Uh, lots of great advice. Please be looking at the chat. Uh, I want to just give a little um, overview and we'll keep taking some questions and, 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 and uh, uh, about something that is coming up. It was mentioned way earlier today. Maybe you weren't even here. But if you haven't had enough of earthquakes and learning about uh, earthquake science, and particularly if you're in the Bay Area, but really for um, across the state, uh, coming up at 11, there is another webinar that you were able to join. And if we could definitely get that link into the chat, it's a, something of a long leak, link. So um, it would be helpful. But this is, the webinar is going to be about the, the release of the final report based on the U.S. Geological Survey uh, haywired scenario of a magnitude 7 on the Hayward Fault. And now, we talked about the Loma Prieta earthquake. That earthquake was centered, if you look at the map on the screen, south of the area that's in, in red here, south of San Jose, is where the epicenter of that earthquake was. And the shaking, of course, was felt over the region, but most of the damage was concentrated in areas right near the water uh, where, uh, with the sediments and the, and the construction that was built on kind of uh, reclaimed land and freeways and other things. Uh, <laughs> Whereas in this earthquake, the, the earthquake will be centered right near Oakland. Uh, the shaking will actually go in both directions, to the north and to the south. And uh, I can even show you what that looks like. So uh, this is another study that's looked at very comprehensively what will happen during it. Oop, let me start it. Uh, oh, it's not a video. It's just 
sorry, that, that didn't quite work. Um, but if you go to hey, uh, search for Haywired, uh, you'll be able to see this video on YouTube as well as just in a, in a Google search. So coming up at 11, here's the link. Uh, hopefully it's, it can be put into the chat um, while I'm talking here, uh, but a comprehensive overview of what can happen during earthquakes, especially affecting our interconnected society uh, and uh, resources and, and uh, materials available uh, for you. So it, while it's Bay Area, the interconnectedness and the, the issues that are presented in the scenario really are what can happen in an earthquake anywhere. Okay, so uh, if you go to that link, you can sign up to join that as well. Let's go back. Uh, Sharon, are there any more questions that we want to uh, pull from the chat to ask? Should we leave doors open to prevent them getting stuck during an earthquake? Well, that uh, uh, there is the potential situation where the building can shift in a way that the your door might get stuck. That is why uh, people often uh, suggest having a small crowbar in that bag that you would attach to your bed so that you might be able to get out of your bedroom. Uh, obviously you don't know when the earth is going to come and there's different times where you may want to have the door open or closed. Uh, it is, uh, if you're able to leave the door open on a regular basis, perhaps, uh, that is a good idea. Now, perhaps after a, a major earthquake, when you are having, uh, the likelihood of frequent earthquakes called aftershocks, that might be a good time to do so. Also, Mark and Sharon and others with us today, there is one key trivia question that we didn't know we would get to. And I think now would be a great time to ask that question. Based, and it's already, the answer has already been mentioned later on. But the question is what is the source of most earthquake injuries? There's a few ways to answer this trivia question. The first person to get it right will win a prize. But the question again is what is the source of most earthquake injuries? I've seen it uh, answer well, both in the Zoom chat as well as in the YouTube chat. So okay, and yeah, yeah so of course we are uh, we are here on looking at Zoom and the uh, the people that joined us through Zoom who were relying on American uh, sign language. Um, uh, there are some chats there, but on the YouTube live, uh, it looks like the first correct answer has already been made. And um, that is going to depend on a few other elements there. Oh, well, the suspense is killing us, isn't it? Um, what well, you can figure that out and, and message them. Uh, we, we do want to wrap up here and just make sure that you see some of the links we have on our screen and ways to contact us for more information. If you did take any pictures today or, or will, uh, you can, uh, and you want to post on social media, use the hashtag shakeout. Um, if you haven't registered and you just did an earthquake drill, do go to shakeout.org slash California and register you as an individual or, or others that you were with. Uh, or make sure your organization is registered. We're over 7.6 million and climbing still in terms of the number of participants this year. Uh, lots of information and follow us on our social media, both for ShakeOut and the Earthquake Country Alliance. You can see there. And Mark, um, do you want to provide a reminder? Someone has asked in the chat, will the presentation be available to review again at a later date? Yeah, uh, uh, Jason, right. It's pretty much right after we end, it will be posted uh, for viewing or, or shortly thereafter, right on the youtube.com slash great shakeout channel we're watching now. That's right. It'll be available to view right here on youtube.com slash great shakeout. Any other questions that we want to, in a, maybe two more minutes here before we wrap up? 
And thank you everyone for staying with us. We're also closing thoughts from our presenters, Pamela, our co-presenters and co-hosts, Pamela Diaz and uh, with California Earthquake Authority or Jenna Ruiz for the Insurance Information yeah. Institute. Well, this is Janet Ruiz with the Insurance Information Institute. I just wanna thank the uh, Earthquake Country Alliance and SCAC and all the presenters today because this is amazing information uh, to have all in one session. Uh, I think you covered you know, so many aspects of earthquakes and why do we need to pay attention? We're not gonna you know, know when it's gonna happen. Like we said, we don't have an earthquake season. Uh, so I really want, appreciate that these um, experts in their fields and scientists can give us so much information on what causes earthquakes, what happens during them, and how do we prepare? How do we react to them? Uh, I think the CERT training, the MyShake app, of the financial preparedness, all are things that if we pay attention to and do, we're not gonna be impacted in a terrible way during an earthquake. And uh, community resilience is key. So thank you again to all of the presenters. This was amazing. I really appreciate all your time and effort. Well, thank you, Janet. We know you spent uh, yesterday in a shape trailer around the Bay Area, <laughs> all sorts of appearances with media and others. So we know you are looking forward to a break today as well. <laughs> Pamela, what about you? Closing thoughts. Oh, you're on mute. You're on mute. Thank you, everybody, for, for participating in this uh, earthquake drill. We do this every year. This time is virtual. And uh, the commitment from people to practice the three steps to earthquake safety, in this case, uh, drop, cover, and hold on to know what to do when the earthquake uh, strikes here in California or anywhere. And uh, also to be prepared, not only for the moment of the earthquake, but also before the earthquake happens to have the earthquake kits to secure your space, to strengthen your home. And uh, we look forward to this participation to grow even larger in the coming years as more people become aware that this risk is a reality uh, for Californians. And uh, we need to take this Seriously, an earthquake can happen at any moment and knowing what to do, how to react, to not panic and uh, drop covering hold on is uh, the safest thing to do. And uh, thank you for everyone for participating and uh, we're honored to be part of this. Thank you, Pamela. Thanks, Pamela. Thank you for sharing all the, the different things you did on the call today with the video and all and the audio for the drill. Her pleasure. Thanks. Okay. Well, be sure to register at shakeout.org if you haven't already your participation in Shakeout. This webinar counts. This YouTube live event counts as participation in Shakeout if you did a drill with us. Mark, do you have any other closing thoughts? You yeah, are there any further questions or comments from our partners on the call? Anybody would like to? Uh, share any um, from our panelists here today. Any others? Shakeout was created as a one-time event back in 2008. It's really amazing to see how it's continued to, to uh, uh, be something that has not only continued in California, but is growing across the world. Uh, we really appreciate your participation today. And I heard someone was going to, uh, was there anyone else? Uh, so thank you all for joining us. And definitely uh, the webinar link is the same link you joined again, youtube.com slash great shakeout. Not a special another link. It's just going to be here uh, once uh, we, end, maybe not immediately, but with in some brief period of time. And that's right. Uh, the, the answer to the trivia question will be chatted here soon. 
And the, the most correct answer, there were some good ones, but the most correct answer is actually unsecured items. Tricky, but that uh, commenter was named Michelle. And so Michelle, I'll reach out to you here. Uh, thank you everyone for being with us today. Happy International Shakeout Day. And until next time. Thanks everyone.